Okay, so what we want to look at today is, we talked yesterday about the three methods of heat transfer. What were the three methods of heat transfer? Radiation, Radiation is one. Convection. Conduction. All right. Um, so we said conduction has a very small part to play, almost negligible in terms of transferring energy on a global scale because it happens in solids and it doesn't happen over large distances, so it's not a very big thing. Radiation is important because that's how we get all of the energy. It's not really important for transferring it once it gets here, but it's important for receiving it. And we said that convection was the most important of the three in terms of transferring energy on a global scale, okay? And that that convection was happening within the atmosphere. The atmosphere is made of air. Convection means the air is moving, and moving air is called wind, okay? So that's what we're going to be looking at here is how do these mechanisms of wind work? Are there actually patterns to wind, okay, on Earth? And kind of where are those patterns and why do they occur, right? Around here, our wind typically comes from which direction? That way. What way is that way? West, southwest, yeah, okay, generally from the southwest around here, okay, uh, because we're in a region of the world where, because of the Earth's rotation, generally winds come from that direction, okay, the product of, of prevailing wind is actually the result of convection as well as the Earth's rotation, okay, the atmosphere and the Earth are not attached, so the Earth kind of spins underneath the atmosphere a little bit, I mean, the atmosphere moves kind of with it, but they're not fixed, okay? It's not like a tire to a wheel, okay, where the wheel and the tire have to spin at the same rate, okay? The atmosphere and the earth don't have to do that, okay? They can spin separately, and so sometimes you'll see the earth spinning one way, but air going the other, okay? You often see that with, like, hurricanes. If you watch a hurricane kind of track on a map, you'll see the earth spinning one way and the hurricane is tracking the other way, all right? So it's possible for the atmosphere to move in a different direction than the earth is under it, all right? And that's kind of what we're going to look at today. All right, so we got to look at how energy is distributed on Earth. What part of the Earth gets the most energy? The equator, okay? It's got to get from the equator to other parts of the Earth, and it's going to do that through convection, okay, which is going to be wind, all right? That's, that's the main way it's got to move. Okay, so we got to look at the role that winds play in distributing energy, okay? Generally, they're going to be distributing energy from equatorial regions to the poles, but that's not always the case. Sometimes we can get them moving the other way, okay? Uh, and know that the Coriol what the Coriolis effect is, right? That's going to be an important one. I often have people explain that on the unit exam, okay? Show them maybe like a picture or a situation, and they have to describe and explain what it is, okay? Um, and recognize that global wind patterns are the product of convection and the Earth's rotation. Essentially, that's what that is. Okay? The combination of those two things is sort of what the Coriolis effect is. Questions so far? Okay. Okay. So the Earth's atmosphere is always moving. Okay? There's always differences in temperature and there's always differences in pressure, and nature always wants balance. So there's always air that's moving to try and balance either pressure or temperature differences on the Earth. Okay, so we get um, a constant movement of air. Okay, right now, our movement of air is coming from where? It's coming from the north. Okay, we're getting this, this wicked kind of polar thing going on, okay, where we're getting well below average temperatures, okay, for the next, like, week and a half or so, okay. Uh, it's even worse out east, okay. I say out east, it's Toronto, that's central Canada, but I call it east because I was born out here, and anything west of Saskatchewan is east to me. Okay, all right, um, so we've got, uh, we've got this really strange kind of polar thing going on where temperatures are really, really low, okay. Well, Eventually, there's got to be some sort of equalization. So if we are, not really what this diagram is for, but if we're right here, okay, on the other side of the Earth, there's some really warm stuff happening, okay, over in Iceland and off the coast of England, things like that. There's this really warm thing going on, and there's a movement across the pole, okay, that's going to balance that out eventually, right? So there's always going to be some movement in an attempt to achieve balance. Balance is never really achieved, but that's why it's always in motion. Now, here's what goes on for the Earth. The Earth rotates this way. 
Okay? It rotates from left to right. That's why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Okay? So if we're right over here, that's about where we are right now because the sun's kind of just coming up. Okay? We rotate into the sun. So if I'm standing right here and I'm looking over there, I see the sun come up. Okay? And as we rotate underneath the sun, it goes overhead. And then when we're over here, we look to the west and we see the sunset over there. Everyone follow me on that? If you did not know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, you've been living under a rock your whole life. Okay? It's time to get out from under that rock and know that the sun sets in the west, rises in the east. Okay. Um, now, what happens is, is the earth rotates this direction. A lot of times we get, um, we get a feeling of movement of air simply because the earth is moving. Okay? It's like if you don't do this, but if you roll down the window on your car, and stuck your head out the window while the car was moving. Okay? The air is not moving, but it feels pretty windy to you. Agreed? Okay? Because you are moving through the air at a high rate of speed. Okay? So it feels windy. The air is not really moving, but you're moving through it. And that, that's kind of what produces some of the wind patterns that we see. The fact that we actually are being pushed through the Earth's atmosphere by the rotation of the Earth. Okay? All right. So nature does not like imbalance or inequity. Okay, variations in temperature create variations in pressure, and as a result, air moves from areas of high pressure to low pressure, or from areas of high temperature to low temperature, okay, and we sense that movement as wind, okay. Some places are going to have more wind than others, okay, simply by their, the nature of their location. Lethbridge is like the windiest city in Canada, okay. Chicago is called the Windy City because it gets all kinds of wind down there, okay, in the United States, okay, just a matter of location, you get wind in certain places more so than others. Okay, so wind in turn transports heat energy and moisture, okay? Now, we talked about that a little bit yesterday when we talked about this. Okay, when we talked about latent heat, okay? We talked about how um, when water is evaporated, it takes a lot of energy to do that. And that energy stays in the water vapor until the water vapor does what? It takes energy to make it a vapor, but what does the vapor eventually do? It condenses. When it does that, it has to release that energy. Okay? Did we talk about yesterday why you get burned worse than worse worse by steam than by water? Okay? Okay, you always get burned worse by steam than by water, not because steam can be hotter. You'd get burned worse by steam at 100 than you would by water at 100, even though they're the same temperature. Okay? Steam has absorbed an exponentially larger amount of energy in order to change state from liquid to gas. Okay? And when it condenses, it has to release that energy. It can't keep it if it's not going to be in a vapor state anymore. Right? So it releases all of that energy and it turns from what we call latent heat that we can't sense to sensible heat that we can. Okay? And that's actually the energy that causes the really bad burns that steam can cause versus really hot water okay, is all this latent heat that's stored inside of it. Right? So if water evaporates from, let's say, a, a tropical area, like down here, and it gets carried up to a more northerly area and then condenses, we're moving energy without moving temperature. Okay? Without moving a huge kind of mass of air, we're moving this moisture up instead okay, and allowing its potential energy, essentially, to, uh, to heat up that area once it condenses. You guys follow there? So that's another way that wind can carry energy from an equatorial area. And that's an important thing to understand. It's not just about moving warm air masses. Sometimes it's about moving potential energy in water vapor. Okay, the jet stream. How many people have heard of that? Okay, so the jet stream is this really high altitude wind, okay, that blows really, really fast, but its location changes all the time. Okay? Its location is affected by areas of high pressure and low pressure, so it moves around. And it's one of the main things that meteorologists watch because the location of the jet stream can really help them to predict weather over the next couple of days. If they see the jet stream moving in a certain way, then they know what's going to, going to happen or they can predict what's going to happen with fairly decent certainty over the next few days. Now, um, again, with this whole weird, we're in the cold, but over by England, they're really in the hot. Um, this is caused by a very strange pattern in the jet stream that hasn't really happened so much that we've really seen before. Um, and it's causing 
such a massive flow of energy over the pole that uh, I was hearing on the on the weather network the other day that flight times from London to Toronto were reduced by 90 minutes. Okay, planes were able to get up into this jet stream, and it was essentially like putting up a sail in a hurricane. Okay, it just picked them up and pushed them all the way across. Okay, and they were able to fly at higher speeds with using less fuel and arrive at their destinations earlier because they were able to get up into the jet stream and move much more quickly. Okay. Um, most of the time, it doesn't work quite that well. Pilots usually try to get into the jet stream. They file flight plans that kind of follow where it's going to be because they know they'll use less fuel. If you're going against the jet stream, then you're in a lot of trouble. How many people have been in a plane where there was a lot of turbulence? Okay, They had one really bad over the holidays, right? Those, there were a bunch of people that were injured. They had to, they had to divert and land in Calgary because they had they hit a cold air pocket and the plane dropped really fast and the people weren't strapped. Some of the people weren't wearing their seatbelts. And when that happens, the plane drops, but because of inertia, you stay put. That's not good with the overhead bin. Okay? And a bunch of them were, they had some pretty bad neck and back injuries uh, because they were going across the jet stream. Sometimes you have to. You try and, you know, the pilot will often try to change altitude to avoid it. Okay? But in some cases, there's just nothing you can do. And you're going to have a rough flight. Okay? That's when you don't get the peanuts and pop okay? on a rough flight. Okay. In fact, uh, I think it was about now, about 20 years ago, there was an Air Japan flight that hit a cold air pocket and a bunch of people were killed on the plane. It didn't crash, but they weren't wearing their seatbelts. And they, the plane dropped, I think it was something like 20 or 30 feet, just poof, just dropped really quick. And they, they had their necks broken because they, they stayed put. The plane dropped and they hit their heads on the overhead bins. And okay. yeah, there was like 15 or 20 of them on the plane. Okay. That's why now, if you've ever flown on a plane, they say, Please keep your seatbelt on if you're not, you know, going to the bathroom or something like that. Always keep your seatbelt on it's in case they hit a cold air pocket, something like that. It's a pretty safety hazard. Okay, so the jet stream, okay, the jet stream's a big deal because you can, if you follow the path of the one on this picture here, okay, you can see that any air that's going to be around the jet stream is going to move with it. So if the jet stream is going by this warm, dry air, it's going to pull some of that warm, dry air down to here. And it's going to, be ca it's going to cause uh, what they call like unsettled, um, unsettled weather because you've got chilly air moving down from here and it's going to be combining with air that's been taken out to sea where it'll pick up moisture and then brought in here where it'll combine with cold air. Right? And so right through here, they're going to have unsettled weather. That would be like thunderstorms and things like that. Now, this is a typical pattern because this is Tornado Alley right through here. Okay, So they often have a pattern like this because there's usually a high pressure area in here. There's usually cold air running down this direction. Okay, But if you get really warm air that moves in rapidly and has a lot of moisture, you don't want that encountering cold, dry air because okay? it's going to make, make for lots of really unsettled weather. Okay. Um, so you can see, though, that the jet stream moves around areas of high pressure. Okay. This high pressure area is blocking the jet stream from going up, so it's forced to go out this way. Okay. And based on this, if this high pressure area starts to move, it'll push the jet stream over, and that would push that chilly air down this way. So if you ever watch the guys on the Telestrator, they kind of do what I'm doing right now. Right, the weather guys, and they're like, and this is going to move this way, and they do all that kind of, and that's what they're doing. Essentially, they're tracing where the jet stream is going and how it's going to push air masses around, okay? and that's how they predict the weather. All right, so the jet stream is important because it can, um, it can move air masses from polar to tropical areas or vice versa. Okay, the the important part would be moving air masses from polar areas to tropical areas because that's not sort of a natural flow of things. That's going sort of against the second law of thermodynamics, right? But if you get enough pressure differential, you can get wind that'll force it to go the other way. All right. Now the other thing to remember here is that um, the the jet stream isn't at the surface, okay? The jet stream is not a wind that we feel, unless you're on the top of like Mount Everest or K2 or something like that where you could actually be high enough to catch the jet stream. Um, in fact, as a climber, it's something that they watch for. Uh, you can see when the jet stream is going to be low and crossing really tall mountains because you'll see there'll be no wind at the lower altitudes, but you'll see what's called spin drift 
So if you have a bunch of mountains, okay, you'll see spin drift. You'll see kind of snow blowing off the tops and making these kind of spinning patterns off the top of the mountains. Okay, that means that it's really windy up top, and the jet stream has kind of descended down to a level where it hits the top of the mountains. You don't want to be on the mountains at that time because these winds are really, really fast, several hundred kilometers an hour. Okay, so you don't want to be on the top of Mount Everest in that kind of wind, right? Because it'll get you killed. What's that? Except, yeah, someone mentioned that yesterday. What if someone jumped off Mount Everest in a squirrel suit? You know what would happen? There's, the air is too thin. Okay, if you jump off Mount Everest in a squirrel suit, you're going to become a crater somewhere. Okay, um, you can't, like, if you get in trouble, they can't come up to the top of Everest in a helicopter to get you. The air is too thin. Helicopters don't create enough lift in that thin air. Okay? So yeah, a squirrel suit's not going to work up there either. You're just going to go, oh crap. Yeah, okay? you're going to be in really big trouble. All right, so that's what the jet stream is. Jet stream is really important. Okay? It's one of the kind of big three uh, methods that energy is moved around kind of on a global scale. Right? So jet stream is pretty important that way. All right, prevailing winds are the winds that happen when there's not some strange weather pattern going on. Right now we got one of those kind of outside the box weather patterns going on. Most of the time wind comes from the southwest. Here's why. At the equator we know they get more energy there. Okay? And so hot air rises at the equator. Well, if only the air rises and nothing moves in to replace it, you'd create a vacuum and that just doesn't happen. So when the hot air rises, as you can see right here, cooler air from above will move in to replace it. And then you'll get this cycle going on. Okay? This is called whoop, not two C's, convection currents. Okay? So these are convection currents. This is convection going on. But while this is going on, the earth is spinning. Okay? So the air is trying to move in a circular pattern, but the earth is spinning underneath it this direction. So, if I'm standing here, it feels to me like the wind is moving this way. Okay, everyone follow me on that? It should feel to me like it's going from north to south. It should feel that way because the air has risen and is moving northward and this air is moving southward. But because the earth spins underneath it, it gets deflected. Right? And it makes it feel like it's coming from the northeast. Okay? We call these the trade winds, these ones here at the equator. They're called the trade winds. Okay? Because that's how you used to get sailing ships in the old, in kind of when the, the new world was being you know, colonized. They would get over to the Americas by capturing the, uh, the, the trade winds. They'd leave from like Spain and Portugal and places like that, and they would sail across, and then they'd sail up the coast and, and drop off their cargo. Okay? How do they get back? To Europe. If the wind was blowing this way, how do they get back to Europe? Yeah, as they go up the coast, they catch the westerlies, and the westerlies blow them back to Europe. Okay, that was kind of the trade route between Europe and the Americas. Okay, during the the era of sailing ships, that's that's how you did it. So you had your trade winds, and then you had your westerlies. I don't know why they weren't called trades, but they're not. Okay, um, so these were the trade winds here down below, and they're caused by convection in addition to the spinning of the Earth. All right up here. Still a similar pattern, okay? except that the convection current is working the other way. So this warm air has moved from here, and when it gets to here, it actually gets forced downwards closer to the surface. But it continues to move north because it's warmer than the air that's here. Okay? So this part follows the second law of thermodynamics, just doing it closer to the surface. As it moves, it pushes cold air out of the way. Okay? And that cold air okay, tries to essentially get it get pushed this direction as well, but warm air pushes it this way. Okay? And you get a bit of a cycle going, not really a true cycle in our part of the world. Okay? Again, the Earth spins underneath this, but instead of pushing it to the left, it pushes it to the right, because all of our air is trying to move upwards, so it gets deflected this way. Air moving southwards gets deflected this way. All right, everyone follow? Okay? But as air moves northwards, it actually gets pulled along with the Earth. Okay, instead of trying to go against it. So we get westerlies in our part of the world. Now you'll notice our part of the world, right about here, is right at the upper edge of the westerly area. Okay? 
If you go up to Edmonton, Fort McMurray, their winds are not typically out of the west. Their winds are typically out of the north. Okay, we're kind of the upper edge of that westerly area. Okay, up near the pole, you've got what are called the polar easterlies, okay, or the polar vortex, if you've ever heard that term. Sometimes we call it that when we're getting weather like we are right now. Okay, the polar vortex means that air is being pulled or pushed from the pole, okay, and because it's trying to move southwards, it's getting deflected this way. So it feels like it's coming from the northeast. And we know when we get a wind from the northeast, nothing good weather-wise is on its way to us. Okay, because the only thing that can come is cold air. Okay, all right, everyone following me on that? Okay, so it's the earth rotating and the earth and the air moving around while the earth is rotating that produces prevailing winds. If you're near the, near the equator, you're going to feel easterly winds most of the time. Okay, if you're where we are, westerly winds most of the time. The entire United States is in the westerly part of this. Okay, you go further north than that, so let's say Red Deer kind of being the final dividing line, okay, you would get okay, mostly easterly winds coming from the pole. All right, so convection and the spin of the earth okay, creates prevailing winds. If you want to look at that mathematically, it looks like this. Prevailing winds equals Okay, now, again, we talked a little bit earlier here about, um, about watching a hurricane track, okay? And watching a hurricane track is, you can actually see where it enters, where it goes from being in the, the equatorial trade winds to where it goes to being in the westerlies, okay? Because typically, when you watch a hurricane track, hurricanes are always kind of built down in this area, and then you'll see them building and building and building and getting bigger and bigger, and they'll move in towards the land. Right here, usually around like Cuba and Florida and that kind of area, okay? And then, instead of continuing to make landfall and go this way, they typically kind of falter along the shore and then head back out, right? They are getting blown kind of this way, but they always catch right here where the winds start to blow to the west, and then once they get over land, they don't build anymore and they kind of fizzle out and get pushed back out to see where they fade out. All right, so it's another example of where you can see that direction of wind change. Now, sometimes you can see that on a weather map on Earth, but the best place to see it is actually on Jupiter. If you've ever watched videos of Jupiter, I'm going to show you one. It actually looks like when you watch it, parts of Jupiter spin one way and parts of Jupiter spin the other way. It looks like that because Jupiter's all gas and the gases are all different colors. So it gets these bands and the bands are caused by exactly this process. Near the equator, all the winds are blowing this way. But a little further north, they're blowing this way. And a little further north than that, they're going back this way. Jupiter's much bigger, so it actually has like four or five bands instead of three, okay? Just because it's so much bigger, right? And you can actually watch that happen, okay? And because it, it's colored instead of clear like our atmosphere, it's much more evident. Okay. All right, just basically saying the same thing. Okay, um, just, it's just kind of finishing off with, with the westerly part here. So you can see, again, the convection currents spinning right here. Okay, and then as, as air moves down against the surface, it gets deflected this way. Okay, up here where, where convection currents are kind of going the other way, okay, we get winds deflected to the west. And then again at the poles, we get the vortex. Okay, and it's kind of always spinning from an easterly direction up top. Okay. So I'm going to show you this here now. You can actually see here's the equator of Jupiter kind of right here, right? And you can see that on Jupiter, when we watch this video, you'll be able to see that effect, okay? Where this part looks like it's spinning this way, but when you look at this band, it's going that way, and then this way, and then this way. And, and it's, it looks really funky when you see it slowed down, and you can actually watch that happen. I went there. Okay, you could really see the, the different directions that the wind was flowing there on, on Jupiter. Okay. And again, remember that these prevailing winds are caused by two things, convection and the spinning of the planet. Well, since Jupiter has 
an atmosphere that's made of hydrogen, which is lighter, okay, and it spins way faster than Earth. Okay, remember, they said it spins once around in 12 hours, where it takes Earth 24 hours, and Earth is way smaller. It's, it's creating a lot of, of that, conve or that um, Coriolis effect, which we're about to talk about now, this deflection of the winds because of the spinning. All right, so the Coriolis effect. Okay, the Coriolis effect is the deflection of, in this case, air and wind, because the Earth spins underneath its atmosphere. Okay, so if I've got a, a ball that's spinning, and I'm going to do this with a basketball in just a minute, okay, um, if I have an object that's spinning this direction, so they're showing the direction of rotation of the Earth here with this arrow, okay, spinning this way, if I try and hit a target that's here, okay, um, and or sorry, I hit a, try and hit a target that's right here, and I, let's say, roll a ball down the earth, I'm not going to hit that target, am I? Because that target is going to move. But the ball that I roll down is going to move straight down. Okay? It's going to move straight down, except that the earth spun underneath it as it went. Okay? It's the same with the winds. The winds are actually, the, the atmosphere is actually moving near the equator from north to south. But because we're on the earth and we move into it, it feels to us like it's doing this. Okay? It isn't really, but we're moving into it as it goes, and that gives us the sensation that that's what it's doing. Okay, everyone follow me there? Yeah? Okay, I'm just going to grab my ghetto demo here. All right, I want you guys to uh, answer those questions here. I'll give you a few minutes. Just you know, write a, a sentence or two for each one. Okay, then we'll go through them, and then we're going to move on to specific heat capacity after a short break. Okay, if there's an unequal distribution of thermal energy, what's going to happen? Exactly, wind is going to happen. Second law of thermodynamics says something's got to move to balance the difference in energy. Okay. And that thing is going to be wind. Okay, for number two, explain how the Coriolis effect influences the direction of winds in the northern hemisphere. Well, as the air attempts to undergo convection, okay, and that is spin in a vertical fashion, the earth spins horizontally underneath it. Okay, and that doesn't mean that that actually changes the direction of the wind. It just makes our perception of the direction of the wind change. Okay? It was like we said at the beginning of class. If you were to roll down the window of your car while it was moving and stick your head out the window, you would think that there was wind coming from the direction of the front of your car because you're moving into the air at a high rate of speed. Well, that's what you're doing as air is moving from north to south and you're spinning from west to east. Okay? It feels like the wind is coming from the northeast. Okay, or vice versa. If you're up in the other areas where you're where you're moving from north from south to north, okay, you get kind of deflected along with the earth. Okay, in those situations. All right, number three. What are the trade winds and where do they occur? Trade winds come from which direction? East, okay? They are easterly winds. Winds are always named by the direction of their origin, not the direction they're blowing, okay? Easterly winds blow from east to west. They're easterlies, okay? Westerlies blow from west to east, okay? So the trade winds are easterly winds that occur basically between 0 and 30 degrees latitude, either north or south of the equator, okay? So we're looking at here's the earth, okay? Here's the equator, Okay, there would be about 30 degrees, there's about 60 degrees, okay, that's not very good, but okay, you get the idea. All right, 90 degrees is the poles, right, something like that, or the Arctic Circle, actually. Um, so, this would be where our trades are, north and south of the equator, okay, here's our westerlies, okay, same down here, really only Australia feels those, okay, and, and then we have our polar easterlies up here. Okay, and down at the bottom as well. Okay, making sense? All right, and jet streams, what are those? They are um, intermediate with the mechanism to get on the temperature in the polar constellations, so it's like trans. Yeah, it is. It's a mechanism that can move. 
essentially air masses from places where they wouldn't normally go to places they wouldn't normally go. Because of the way it can, it can shape itself because of high and low pressure, it can bring air masses from really northerly areas to really southerly areas and vice versa. And it's the jet stream that causes those kind of quick changes in our weather. Okay, where we go from, oh, it's been nice and sunny and hot, to suddenly we got four days of rain, okay, uh, because it, we brought up this air mass that um, was interacting with some cold air that was moving in, and, and the, so the jet stream can move a lot of latent heat as well, okay, um, so moves air masses and latent heat, I would say, would be an important part of the description of the jet stream. Okay, that latent heat is all that moisture that contains all that potential thermal energy. Okay, everybody good with those?